Welcome to the Health Leader Forge. My name is Mark Bonica, and I'm a professor of health management and policy here at the University of New Hampshire and the host of the podcast. And today I'm joined by two co-hosts. Ladies, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourselves? I'm Caroline Swenny. I'm a junior here at the University of New Hampshire, and I'm interning at Exeter Hospital this summer. My name is Reagan Judge. I'm also a junior at the University of New Hampshire, and I will be interning at Exeter Hospital this summer. So who did you guys interview for the podcast today? We interviewed Greg White, the CEO of Lamprey Health Systems. Excellent. And, and what did you learn that you think was really interesting from the conversation with Greg? Um, one piece of our conversation I found to be really valuable was our discussion about mentorship. Greg had a lot of different experiences with a lot of different leaders, and I found that interesting that he was able to learn many different things from many different people. I'm from Lowell, and Greg spent some time in Lowell, and I thought it was interesting to learn about his time at the federally qualified health centers there. Great. All right. Uh, I think it was a really great interview. You guys did a great job. So without further ado, here is Caroline Reagan and Greg White from Lamprey Healthcare. Welcome to The Forge, Greg. Thank you. You went to Babson College in Wellesley, Mass. What brought you there, and what did you study there? Uh, well, I was coming out of high school. I certainly was interested in business, though at that time I wasn't really sure what area. When I got there, uh, we had a chance to try, obviously, like most freshmen, a, a number of different avenues. And being somewhat introverted, the, the numbers seemed to appeal to me. So I went down the accounting road. Um, what drew you to accounting? Well, I hate to put the stereotype of being a little introverted and, and like to kind of work by yourself a little bit and, and it certainly clicked and being strong in math and uh, it seemed like a profession uh, that I could pursue so I had the interest in becoming a CPA. You first worked as a staff accountant at Alexander Ahrens and Finning & Co. CPAs in Westboro, Mass. What did you do as a staff accountant? So at Alexander Aronson, I was a staff accountant, but what we did uh, is function as, a, as an auditor. So I would go out, I spent most of my time out of the office. Uh, I was out at clients doing financial audits where you would basically verify their financial statements, make sure they're presented fairly, do a little business consultation, tax return preparation, uh, cost report preparation. So as it turned out, most of my clients were not for profit. I was a little surprised actually going into public accounting. I was anticipating going out to, you know, State Street in Boston, big manufacturers. All of my clients were inner city nonprofits. Uh, a, little, a little eye opening, I would have to say. So. And what did you enjoy most about that position? Well, I got a chance to learn. I got a lot of uh, opportunity to see different communities, the inner workings of, of small social service organizations. And I think it opens your eyes to perhaps some of the ills of our society in terms of the shortcomings of our healthcare system, housing, poverty, things that you, know, you might have thought about, but perhaps hadn't impacted you personally. So uh, it was very eye-opening. And actually, I, I forged some great relationships with people while I was there. So, Can you give me a couple examples of the organizations you worked with? So uh, as a staff auditor for this firm in particular, I had the opportunity to work with community health centers such as this organization, community development corporations, which deal more with housing issues, uh, and social service organizations, which I you lump together and each one is very specific to each community. So there was some that dealt with gang violence. There were some that dealt with getting people to work. There were some that dealt with pregnant moms and, and uh, nutrition. So they tended to be very grant or funding specific. Uh, I think I forged some great relationships, particularly in the healthcare community, health center community. And that was actually the jumping off point for my career. Um, you left Alexander and Aronson in 1990 and joined the staff at Greater Lawrence Family Health Center. What was the Greater Lawrence Family Health Center? So the Greater Lawrence Family Health Center was one of my clients, actually. I was the auditor on that engagement for a couple of years. They are a community health center much like this, and at the time when I, I left being an auditor, they were about to start a, a new residency training program and were about to embark on the construction of a 50,000 square foot new facility. So I had forged a great relationship with the CFO of that organization and he brought me on because he needed the help. I thought it was pretty exciting to get it at the ground level of a new training program and the facility project is always exciting to participate in. So very different from what I was doing as an auditor though. So. 
And what prompted you to transition to healthcare? Well, again, I, I enjoyed working with the clients that I had in the community healthcare field. You know, dad was a banker and mom was a nurse. So <laughs> healthcare finance seemed like a great fit. Um, at the time, too, I, uh, I wanted to get out of public accounting. The, the hours were very demanding at the time, and I'm not critical of that. I learned a lot, but I also wanted to have a family. So I wanted a little steadier pace in terms of my hours and demands. That's not to say that I didn't put in a ton of hours when I got there, but it was a little, kind of a shift of speeds and, and I would say more focused. As an auditor, you had a very broad purview. Okay, this week it's housing, next week it's healthcare. Oh, look, I've got a manufacturer I've got to be at, and okay, now it's it's March and it's tax season. I, you know, I, I'm less of a generalist, more, more specialist. So. Tell us more about the reimbursement model you developed. So as I said, we were developing a new residency training program. So the CFO put it in my hands to come up with a budget that balanced, that incorporated all the costs of the program, that incorporated the added costs of the facility so that we could leverage what's called graduate medical education funding from the federal government. The challenge being is that funding had to come through the hospital, which was not the health center. So there was a bit of a negotiation there. So uh, I built the model that balanced the budget that included as many of our costs as we could reasonably substantiate. And uh, that's where it started. I think it's a little different today, but I'm very proud to have built that. And um, I, I remember vividly uh, not showing up to a company event because I was back at the office putting that model together and feeling thrilled when it finally worked. So a challenge that community health centers face is workforce. So when I say workforce, we oftentimes have a challenge attracting, recruiting, and retaining family physicians, so family practice doctors. So where we were unable to buy that talent, we set about to make that talent. So what we would have is a, a training program with 24 residents who are have graduated from medical school but now have a three-year program of a kind of getting field experience and you know, working under the supervision of other physicians so typically physicians go through a residency based on their specialty so this specialty was family medicine and we see that you held three different positions over your five years how do you feel you grew in the organization I think I grew with the organization because while we were building this program and while we were building that facility, the organization blossomed and grew. We brought on 24 residents. That's a huge capacity enhancement. So I grew from an analyst accounting role to a manager role to a controller role as the finance staff grew. So I was very fortunate to have a CFO that trusted me and kind of treated me like his right-hand person and encouraged me to to seek training and, and develop me. So that was, I think, my good fortune. So, I'm um, looking back on your first job. What are some words of advice you have for young people about to enter into the workforce? I would say don't discount the relationships that you're starting now. And when I say that, the people that you're getting to know. So your professors, your colleagues and friends at school, people that you work with, you'll never know when that comes back to help you. So the folks at Alexander Aronson Finning, the CPA firm I started with, I am still in contact with. In my career, I have crossed paths with them numerous times. I've had the opportunity to refer them as an audit firm. They've had the opportunity to refer me to career opportunities and, and just maintain and build those relationships. Um, you know, 25 some odd years later, I'm still in contact with them and I count them as friends and it has worked well, let's put it that way. So, You left Greater Lawrence Family Health Center in 1998 to go to Manchester Community Health Center as CFO. Why did you decide to make this move? So career opportunity, the CFO in Greater, at Greater Lawrence, uh, I did not anticipate leaving anytime soon and I had a little bit of ambition and desire for upward mobility. So uh, the folks at Alexander Aronson Finning were their audit firm and made it known to me that they were looking for a CFO. So this is a fairly small industry, so it's somewhat specialized so that being experienced in, in, in a community health center was certainly a leg up. That, and it was close to home. Mm -hmm. I'm from New Hampshire, and Manchester was a fairly new community health center at the time, and it was kind of getting off the ground. 
and 20 minutes from my house. So it's probably not my priority, but uh, certainly being close to home with a small family or a growing family um, made a big impact in terms of my availability and seeing my children. So. Yeah. <laughs> But very excited to, to take on that role. I think there were some folks that looked at me kind of funny, like, is that really the move you want to make? Because it was so much smaller than the Greater Lawrence Family Health Center. Um, but in retrospect, I'm very glad I did because uh, it helped me start a new network in a different state. So, And that state is my home state. So. Tell us a bit more about Manchester Community Health Center. What is the nature of the organization? What services did they provide? And what community did you serve? So largely, the it, like a community health center in general, it served the underserved population. We had a very diverse uh, population that we served in terms of non-English speaking. We had a lot of immigrants and refugees. So at the time, we had a lo lot of folks arriving from the Baltic regions, uh, Bosnian folks, Croatian. So we had some language and culture things to learn. It was a primary care medical provider. We had a large OB program. We had some social service type enhancements around uh, interpretation, transportation, nutrition, things like that. So largely primary care. Um, I would say smaller than this present organization at the time and much smaller than Lawrence when I was there. Mm -hmm. So it was a great opportunity to kind of come in at a high level in a small organization because the exposure you get to things beyond finance. So as I arrived, I got to see things and be in, heavily involved in human resources, legal, uh, operating, you know, true operations of the health center in terms of scheduling and compensation and recruitment. And you know, it's, it's something I probably wouldn't have seen as readily in a large organization. Mm -hmm. What was this change in executive position like? In that organization in particular, it, it was it was kind of strange because we were small enough where I would find times where I was doing very nitty gritty accounting work, mm -hmm. you know, really in the weeds of the budget, doing journal entries, making the closing every month, doing payroll, things like that I mean, when somebody was out. And then the next day I might be out in the public with the CEO entertaining a visiting congressman or uh, going to the state to advocate for our funding or, you know, have some very high profile type of endeavors. So it was quite a, a diverse opportunity there in terms of the realm of things that you'd be working in. You know, some days it's, you know, you're, you're not dressed up, you get your sleeves rolled up and you're trying to figure out the budget. The next day you're out, you know, in front of TV cameras. It's a little awkward, but that that's kind of struck me as interesting, I guess. So. so how did you learn from that experience? I think my experience in Manchester, um, I developed beyond being, uh, I guess, the technical expert. I perfected management skills, or I wouldn't say perfected. I built my <laughs> management skills. I improved them. And the CEO there really took me under his wing to sh kind of show me how the organization operates and how board of directors operate and how you interact and how you interact publicly kind of the here's the courtesy way to do things mm -hmm. here is uh, we need to be mindful of how we say something and who we say it to so it was an opportunity to learn i think during your time at the center a new facility was added how is this a challenge to finance and what were some challenges of this task so in our industry, if you were to take a look at our financial statements and determine where all of our funding comes from, it's either the government, the government, or the government, mm -hmm. which is puts it at risk for politics and budgetary things. So things change. So when you're going to a bank looking to borrow money, they want to understand, you know, how will you assure me that you know you'll be able to make the debt payment down mm -hmm. the road when You've got all this Medicaid money, you've got this grant money, you've got Medicare money, and let me understand this, most of your patients are below the federal poverty level and a majority of them have no resources at all. So my response was, well, this is not a model anyone would ever set out to build on purpose, but I would tell you that our track record has grown and we continue to grow and the program is stronger than it has ever been. And uh, I would say it was fairly unique for me because I was the only finance person in the operation aside mm -hmm. from some bookkeeping folks. 
So I have a very vivid memory of going to a, a place in Concord that does uh, public financing for nonprofits and sitting at the end of a long table wearing my suit in front of all these very stern-faced banking finance folks who were basically going to give me the yay or nay as to whether they're going to lend us money. And, and you know, I just laid it out there and was honest with them. It's like, look, our audits are strong. Our finances are strong. We've got some money in the bank. We're responsibly managed. And while there may be some question about the how solid our future funding is, if you look at the track record of growth and continuing to grow, I think I made the case. So they agreed to back our loan. So that was the finance side. The project management wise on a construction project is, is kind of fun if maybe you're not the person in charge. <laughs> I got to certainly be a key component of that, but it wasn't my project to manage. But when you hold the purse strings, uh, you're certainly a key player in that. So being able to take you know, your organization and one relocate it, but to design a facility that suits your needs and in this state of the art, uh, air quotes, <laughs> um, I think it's pretty exciting. And, and to see it come from nothing to the day we moved in, to, to, you know, the big ribbon cutting and all mm -hmm. of that, I think is very rewarding. After working for the Manchester Community Health Center for 12 years, you moved to the Lowell Community Health Center in Lowell, Mass. Mm -hmm. First off, what is this organization like? So similarly, another community health center, but much larger than Manchester, and I would say more reflective of the Lowell community. So again, very diverse, but uh, more so with a Southeast Asian community, a lot of Cambodian folks, a lot of Spanish folks. There's a growing African community there. So arriving there and getting back to my building networks, the CEO of that organization is someone that I used to work with in Lawrence who needed a CFO who needed somebody to come in and one, take hold of the financial operation, but two, get them ready for a major capital project where they would be consolidating five sites within the city into one large rehabilitated mill building. So very complicated financing proposal in terms of government grants, government loans, tax credits, which is god awful complicated, but she needed somebody who could come in and knew the, knew the industry already. So um, I took it on as a challenge, as a growth opportunity, as a much bigger organization. And I looked at it as very challenging, but the challenges are something that you learn from. Yeah, um, I'm from Lowell. I'm just oh, curious. Really? Yeah, I'm curious what um, mill was it? One of Lancet Mill Building on Jackson oh, yeah. Street. So yeah. right now there's a there's an artist's housing next door, and I think there's housing on the other side. Yeah. So it's right across from the new. Well, it's not new now. The parking garage. Yeah. Yeah, they've done really cool things with those mills. Yes, they but, are. Very um, much. So it was at the time of rapid expansion that you mentioned? Yes, quite a bit. So not only were we moving people from multiple sites into one building, but we were growing. So I think we added about 100 staff in the four years that I was there. So we went from about 250 staff to 350. And actually, I think they're over 450 now and growing more. Um, in 2013, you came to Lamprey Healthcare. Can you tell us about Lamprey as an organization? So we are also a community health center, though I would say very different than Lowell, um, where Lowell is uh, an inner city uh, type of operation and very concentrated on the, say, the eight surrounding communities in Lowell Center. Uh, Lamprey is both an urban and a rural operation. So we have three sites, Nashua, Newmarket, and Raymond. Uh, as you might imagine, relatively speaking, Nashua is our urban site and very diverse. Our sites in Newmarket and Raymond are, are more rural, but we're very spread out and we serve 43 communities. So um, we are smaller than the Lowell operation where we have about 16,000 patients. I think Lowell has 30 to 40,000 patients. So we face some different issues. You know, we do have some interpretation challenges in Nashua in terms of the diversity of the patients we serve, but transportation is a challenge uh, in the more rural communities. So, Can you tell us more about the mission of Lamprey? So our mission is to provide high quality primary health care uh, with some focus on lifestyle, but primarily it's to provide those sorts of services without regard to an individual's ability to pay. So whether you have no insurance, whether you have poor insurance, whether you have Medicaid, that's not our concern. We want to make sure we get you in and, and get you primary care. 
Um, how many providers are in this organization? <clears throat> We have about 25 providers. I would say half of them are physicians. The other half are nurse practitioners, physician assistants. We have two obstetricians. We have two pediatricians. We have some behavioral health clinicians as well. Um, you're now the CEO at Lamprey Healthcare. How did you make the transition from CFO to CEO? I have to say that's a big transition, very different. So being a CFO, and regardless of the size of the organization I was at, I felt you were always very much in the details. You are the, you are the rules person. You have to understand how funding works. You have to understand how reimbursement works, a lot of the legalities, how rates are set. So you're very much in the details. Your definition of what work is changes. So in, in, the finance area, you know, you do reports, you run financial statements, you do analysis, you kind of know when your work is done. As the CEO, your, your role is much more outward facing, meaning, you know, I spend my day in meetings. I go to talk to people. I, I integrate with the community. I advocate for the organization and my vision needs to be down the road planning longer term. Now CFOs do that as well, but it was a big shift for me, I found, and, and I had to adjust to, I've got my to-do list today, which is very concrete. I had to do you know, the monthly financial report. I had to do this cost report. I had to review a contract, you know, review a staff person or two. Now it's, you know, I've got to think about something or I've got to read something and make sure that that integrates with our longer term plan. I've got to go meet with the mayor. I've got to go to Concord and testify before a Senate committee as to why continuing to fund us is a good idea, things like that. So a, a bit of a shifting gears for sure, particularly for someone who perhaps is a little introverted and not used to that. So, um, How did your previous roles prepare you to be CEO? I think I was fortunate in that I worked with a couple of folks who trusted me and I would say brought me under their wing to a degree. So I got to see how they worked and I got to see it a very, you know, from a very close distance, how they thought about things, how they went about things, kind of not just the result, but the process that got to that. So uh, I was again, fortunate to have forged some relationships there that folks trusted me and actually looked to me to kind of support their decision making. So that I think I benefited from that. Who reports to you as your senior leadership team? I have a very large team and I suspect perhaps we might need to think about uh, making that a little less flat, but I have a finance officer. I have a chief medical officer. I have an operating officer. I have a clinical director, uh, marketing. I have human resources, I have compliance. Uh, and IT. And I'm sure I've missed one. Oh, and there's a director of our health education programs and the public health network as well. What in terms of work, what is the workplace culture of Lamprey Healthcare like? Well, I think historically we've certainly had a culture of learning. We've had a culture of high quality and a culture of fiscal responsibility, which I think all of which we retain today. Though I would point out each one of our sites is in a different community, and I would say each one of our sites reflects the culture of that community. So in Nashua, we are very diverse. I would say three quarters of our staff are either bi or trilingual, and it's not all English and Spanish. There's Portuguese, there's Arabic, there's Indian dialects, there's a lot of refugee dialects that you know, most folks have not heard of. So uh, very reflective of the folks that work there and reflective of the folks that we serve. I think the over here in Raymond and Newmarket, the cultures are you know, where we have a proximity to UNH and Newmarket. So we have some involvement there. I think our, our culture in Raymond is very unique too. We had a very working class blue collar community and, and we're very tied into that. So what metrics do you keep track of to judge the health of the system short and long term? How do you know you're bringing value to the community? Uh, so we have our operating statistics that we watch every month. Typically, they're financial measures in terms of you know revenue and expense. We have visit volume that we track every month. Presently, in the healthcare world, or at least our world, we're reimbursed based on the numbers of patient visits that we provide. So uh, as volume goes up, revenue goes up. We certainly track active users, which is very important to us as we evolve into perhaps a new reimbursement environment. And we're also watching things like 
quality measures. And when I say quality measures, there are clinical measures that we have to keep track of. One, for our federal grant, but two, I think that's the way the industry is headed. So we need to take a look at outcomes. We need to make sure that certain age groups have had the appropriate screenings, that you know, kiddos have had their well visits and have had their immunizations, that women have gotten breast exams and pap smears, that we're doing prostate screenings, that we're doing uh, depression and hypertension screenings, things like that. So those are all kind of foundational towards better outcomes and things like that in the primary care world. So we also work quite a bit in terms of our community benefit reporting, and there's measures that go into that in terms of the amount of free care that we provide, in terms of the people that we serve. The We often look at the pay mix. When I say pay mix, meaning how many uninsured patients do we have, how many Anthem Blue Cross patients do we have, how many Medicaid patients do we have. Those are all things that we watch fairly closely and are actually important to the folks that fund us. So we are a charitable organization. We're not for profit. So we have oversight from many folks in terms of the local community, the state community, the federal government, things like that. So there are measures that we're held accountable for there as well. What external issues are you looking at? <laughs> Well, right now, the big one subsequent to the elections is um, our funding environment is, um, is a big question mark on it from a public standpoint. So as a community health center right now, we're faced with renewing what's called our Section 330 grant funding, which is comes from the National Public Health Service. And this organization receives about a $3 million grant annually from the federal government to help maintain access to health care. And while it's not all of our budget, it's a substantial piece. We are watching to assure that legislation is enacted to continue that funding beyond September of 2017. There's a large component of that that's set to expire. So that's obviously of concern to us. The other piece is, or there are other pieces, but the two big ones are the continuation of expanded Medicaid uh, has a tremendous impact upon our patients and our organization and some workforce endeavors at the federal level that help us recruit new providers. Have any economic issues? So those are all economic issues for us in terms of the money that comes in. The other side of the equation tends to be um, there's a very good job market right now. So that has a, an upward pressure on inflating salaries and benefits. So while we are not for profit, we do have to show a surplus every year to maintain our existence. So there's the struggle of adequate revenue, you know, raising that and keeping costs as low as you can within reason. So. Um, how sensitive is, is your organization to fluctuation in those measures? Hugely hugely sensitive. Certainly our payer mix is very important. So where you might get paid for a visit at, let's say a hundred dollars, that's a commercial payer. You might get paid as a community health center, $150 for a Medicaid visit, and you might get paid $10 for an uninsured visit. So those, those are very important to watch. You know, certainly the quality measures are important to us. And while the result from a funding or economic standpoint is not immediate long term, we're oftentimes incentivized by our outcomes. So the better the outcomes, an opportunity exists from time to time to enhance your revenue or to share in the savings in the system. What do you see as the biggest health policy issues facing healthcare today and how do those affect Lamprey and the communities you serve? Well, certainly healthcare as a whole, uh, you're aware of the ACA or Obamacare and moves to change that at the federal level. It's certainly not a perfect legislation, but what it did was set about to make sure everyone had insurance coverage. There are aspects that are challenging, I understand, but changes to that will have a profound impact upon us. And depending on how far back that gets rolled in terms of either reduction of benefits or reduction of funding, uh, obviously will land on us fairly hard uh, if it's if it's in any way a reduction. Uh, we are also very dependent upon grant and contract funding that come from the state and federal government as well. So where there's budgetary pressures uh, in those arenas, those numbers tend to get squeezed too. So again, the revenue side is revenue shrinks. I, I have to think about 
um, expense side. And there's policy things, you know, that we think about in terms of laws and, and such. Um, but also looking at the demographic of our community, you know, New Hampshire's aging on average, and that coupled with the, what they're calling the silver tsunami of the of the the baby boomers that are just starting to retire. You know, we've got to think about: Am I set up correctly to serve that demographic of folks? You know, our patients are aging with us to some degree, but uh, so are our providers. So I need to be sure that I'm recruiting the right folks to serve the patients that need the services. The big buzz in the healthcare community is population health. How does Lamprey work to address population health, more specifically the opioid crisis? So population health uh, overall, we've kind of been doing for our existence, mm-hmm. at least on you know, our population. Overall, you're starting to see projects like the Dartmouth-Hitchcock or the, or the Granite Five Hospitals put some what's called accountable care organizations together where they'll be in a position to assume more risk in the healthcare financing realm. So right now, really the risk in the financial risk lies with either the state or the insurance company in terms of, you know, who bears the risk of someone getting sick, uh, et cetera. Right now, our risk is volume related. So where we're not able to see enough patients, the risk is that we won't have enough revenue. The transition under an ACO or population health is I may be tasked with keeping people healthy and I won't be reimbursed on a volume basis, but based on the numbers of patients that I have under my care. So at the same time, I may be accountable to having to pay bills for their services elsewhere. So that shifts the risk and our challenge is we're not likely not big enough to assume that sort of risk, but we are participating in some of these projects. We are participating uh, under what's called an 1115 waiver with the Medicaid program, which, which is where basically the state sought a waiver of the federal Medicaid rules to try something new, uh, particularly around the Medicaid population, to deliver services in a different way with the hopes of perhaps changing the reimbursement mechanism. So we're participating in that, just getting started. So, What is the role of the board for Lamprey Health and how does someone come to be on the board? So at Lamprey Healthcare, our board of directors right now is about 12 people. As a federally qualified health center, more than half of our board members actually have to be consumers of services at our, at our organization. And what they are, they are the governing body of this organization, so they are my boss. Mm -hmm. So I am their one employee. They task me with the day-to-day operations and and putting together plans and and, and whatnot, but it's their job to kind of oversee policy, to kind of set the course and give my direction. Right now, we are a mix of professionals and and folks from the community, so it's, uh, I would say, very a growing, diverse group. Great. How do you develop a strategic plan so that Lamprey will continue to be successful with all the uncertainty in the marketplace? So with all the uncertainty in the marketplace, oftentimes your strategic plan might be short or a little vague in the out years because things are changing. So we're in the midst of a strategic plan right now that that purposely kept it vague so that we could uh, ant- we couldn't anticipate what the changes would be, mm-hmm. but we knew we had to grow the numbers of patients that we're serving. So that I think would hold true regardless of where we ended up in the marketplace. We wanted to work at workforce. We wanted to work at raising our our profile in the community, strategic relationships, particularly along the, the ACO conversation we just had. So we're working closely with some hospital organizations. We're working closely with some mental health organizations. The 1115 waiver projects are tying in the opiate epidemic and with that too. So that's our current plan. I think setting a course, I think once some of our funding environment settles down, will probably happen about the same time when we're about to start our next plan. So in healthcare, it's hard to plan too long term, but we do sense that, you know, obviously there's workforce challenges. There's the shift in demographics and the environment of patients, you know, where everybody now has insurance. Competition means a little more where previously when there was a lack of insurance, you know, people weren't necessarily competing for the patients we were serving. So, mm-hmm. How do you motivate your employees as a CEO? That's a hard one. <laughs> um, 
I, it, it's difficult, you know, certain uh, different people are motivated different ways, mm-hmm. certainly engaging folks and, and letting them participate uh, in, in the process to develop plans, to be communicative, be heard, I, I think is important. I certainly don't think people appreciate, you know, the suits showing up and, you know, here's mm-hmm. what you got to do. I show up and it's like, well, I need to hear from you what our needs are. I need to hear from you what are the issues in the community so that we can use that information to build a program that is successful. You know, some of the, the way we used to do things perhaps isn't as effective now, but that may be a generational thing. People's lives are very busy, so getting together after work isn't as easy as it used to be. Mm-hmm. I think most folks have a... Uh, both parents working in the, in the household now, so people are very protective of their free time. So it's hard to plan things off hours, you know, to have the outings and things. You know, people maybe aren't as interested in that, but people people appreciate recognition too, but uh, oftentimes in different ways. Mm-hmm. So. And what is the most important thing you've learned from the role of CEO? I think it's important to understand that your mission comes first. And as, as I've developed a little bit, you need an inspiration behind what you do. It's not a job, you know, as the CEO, you, you've got to be the cheerleader. You're the chief marketing officer. You're the, you're the, you're the face when something goes well. You're the face when something doesn't go well. And that it's a team effort. You know, this organization is not what it is because of what, because of me. It's because of the people that I work with Mm -hmm. and, I think they need to be recognized for that. I think it's very important to cultivate folks and to let them develop and give them opportunities and give them opportunities to fail, but also give them opportunities to succeed too. So it's not about me. Mm-hmm. What surprised you most about becoming CEO? I had the biggest adjustment to getting used to what the definition of work is. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I come to work and I go to meetings and, you know, I say that kind of facetiously, but that's my role. And, and I, I rather vividly remember arriving here three and a half years ago and within the first two weeks of being here, being asked to show up in Concord to testify before some committee about our funding and absolutely unprepared for that. And again, someone who is perhaps a little more introverted, uh, not my bailiwick, but kind of getting forced out into that a little bit out of your comfort zone uh, didn't kill me. So uh, you get used to that. People certainly look to you for your response and cues as to how to respond to things and, and how to act. But again, you surround yourself with professionals and, and you know, give them a chance. But so I, I would say my style is a little less out in front than some leaders, but uh, I certainly surround myself with folks who know what they're doing and, and help me be that person. Mm-hmm. As a CEO, what keeps you up at night? <laughs> oh boy. The funding environment right now is a big one. Staffing and retention is another big one. It's funny though, as much as my outward role is here, very much of the challenges and stresses are making sure that the inward things are working and that the team is adequately supported and that, you know, the day to day things get addressed. And, you know, like any organizations, there are bumps in the road and things you have to deal with. But, you know, those are the things that take your, take your focus. And, and, you know, if you want a great outcome, you want to put a little time and effort. Mm-hmm. So. What is the thing that people outside of healthcare least understand about running a federally qualified health center? We are a business. We are actually an employer of 160 people. We are not necessarily a small, poor, not-for-profit. We are a sophisticated organization. Mm-hmm. And it does take some skill. It does take some experience and and effort to run an organization like this. This is not something that just anybody can do as a, I'll downsize my career. I'll go run a health center. It is fairly complicated. It's, it's a niche provider, but um, I think it's very rewarding, but we're sophisticated. We've had an electronic medical record for 18 years now. I would say that's probably 10 years more than most providers. So in many ways we're out in front of it. Mm -hmm. And how was the transition going from a larger city like Lowell to a small town like Newmarket? You know, the speed's a little different in terms of the volume of people, but the, the, the concept's the same. It's about relationships. And don't let anybody kid you. The politics in small towns are just as mm-hmm. challenging as they are in the big city. Oftentimes, it's about forging relationships and getting to know folks so that they trust you. 
And, you know, certainly I grew up in a small town in New Hampshire. I know how that works. I appreciate being able to walk down the street and know this person and know that person uh, and, you know, know that they know me and trust me because of work we've done together. It takes a little time to build that for sure. You touched a bit upon this earlier, but how did the community you served change? Well, certainly we're getting older. Um, you know, New Hampshire, like I said, is, is, is in the throes of an opiate epidemic mm-hmm. right now that's heartbreaking. We are not without our ills otherwise in terms of mental health system and things like that. And, and obviously, as we've grown and become, I would say, more heavily populated in the southern tier of the state, uh, some of the, the urban challenges start to show up. And that's not to say that drug abuse isn't a problem in the, in the rural areas, but uh, it's more readily available. Coming from a small town, people oftentimes kept their business to themselves and the problems of alcoholism and domestic abuse and mental health were kind of Mm -hmm. kept to the side. I think perhaps now those things are starting to come to the fore as, gosh, if we can help you, the the outcomes are, you know, they help you with your employment. They, you know, it's a community challenge. So we're starting to see more of that. I guess people more willing to talk about it. Mm and our community in Southern New Hampshire is becoming more diverse. And, and actually, I'm pretty excited about that. How has healthcare changed in the time that you've been working in the field? Certainly with Medicaid expansion in the last few years, we, we've been better funded. As a community health center, we've seen, we've enjoyed a lot of growth. Very pleased with the fact that, you know, this movement started 50 some odd years ago. And we have continued to enjoy bipartisan support at the federal level, which is hard to do. <laughs> but we have benefited from that in terms of core funding and program expansion. So uh, as, as an industry, we serve about 24 million patients across the country. So very pleased with our growth and that we are a sustainable model. Let's transition to talk a bit about leadership. What is your leadership philosophy? I think I talked about it a little bit earlier. I, I'm not the out necessarily one that seeks the spotlight uh, and again, maybe that's more my personality. I tend to like to surround myself with people that are the experts and in the know. And if you need to be need, need me to be out in front, I will do that. But I also want to highlight the folks whose skills and talents that that are getting us to where we are. So I tend to be. I like to relate to folks. I'm a regular person. I'm Greg. Um, if anybody ever called me Mr. White, I look behind me to look for my father because <laughs> I'm not that. I am very, actually very mindful of the suit and tie when I work in some of our buildings because I don't want to intimidate people. You know, I obviously have to dress the part some days in terms of what you're up to, but you know, there's Fridays we wear the dress down and you just kind of blend in and talk with folks and have a relationship, talk about the Red Sox, you name it. You know, I'm, I'm one of the, I work here too. I'm part of the team. My job just happens to be out in the community. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm very proud of the folks that deliver care here. Very proud of the folks that are out in the, you know, the community health workers that are out relating to folks and finding folks in need. So what are the characteristics and behaviors of a good leader and how do you aspire to be those yourself? I think a, a good leader, you know, you've got to you've got to show the it's half perspiration in terms of demonstrating hard work and, and commitment, but there's a, there's the other half is inspiration, and uh, it's very challenging to be an inspiring person unless this comes naturally to mm-hmm. you. Like some of our political leaders are very good speakers and can be very inspiring that way. I've never considered myself to be that, um, but if you speak from the heart and demonstrate that things are meaningful to you, people get that message. So certainly showcasing folks that are the success stories here are are very proud to do that in terms of my leadership style. I think there's very much a distinction between being a manager and a leader. A manager is is tasked with getting things done and and it can be very technical sometimes and, and process oriented and is very necessary. I think to get beyond that as a leader you have to demonstrate you have to live it you have to be out there and and show people this is where we're headed and you know are you ready to follow who did you learn this leadership philosophy from i think over my career between you know obviously my folks growing up but i as i said earlier i had a couple of ceos that i worked with that had a very 
very different styles. One, I think, was a, came from a, a hospital background, was a very excellent manager, showed me the ropes and how things worked from a business side and helped me develop there. The other was a very um, community-oriented person, very engaged with community development and engaging this population of folks or this community or these new arrivals from a new country. And when I got to Lowell, that this is the leader in Lowell, and, and she really gave me an opportunity to pause from being the business guy to being, this is what's important to the to the organization if and if maybe our financial results aren't quite so good we're delivering and we're building trust and she actually showed me the inspiration part which it, it's striking when it gets you and then like suddenly the light goes off like oh my gosh that's why we're doing this and then it means something to you so both were very important to me i think uh, as mentors and, and developed me so it's i just i was very struck by how different they were and what I was able to pick up from both of them. Give an example of a difficult leadership lesson you had to learn the hard way. So we're living it right now. We have a, a system upgrade that's going on with our electronic medical record system. And through some staffing transition, the, the, the commitment was made for this process that seemed like a good idea at the time. And we had a couple of staff transitions happen at the same time. We had to kind of pick up the pieces of this project. Uh, I don't think we adequately engage, engage the users of this system, and it has made for some ill feelings and some strife, so I have to get out there. I own it. Um, you know, I have to acknowledge that this is not going well, and you know, ultimately, it will be my decision as to whether we continue with this. But in terms of my own education, I need to do a better job of making sure I engage the stakeholders and engage them adequately. You know, are they heard? Have we acted upon, you know, what they've what they've shared with in terms of concerns, in terms of successes, mm -hmm. and what does that mean, you know, in the long term? So, we've been fortunate. We've not had to deal with anything, say, like the folks at United Airlines this week. <laughs> uh, those are sort, sorts of things in the back of your mind from time to time that yes, awake you from a sound sleep. That that could easily be you. <laughs> And that happens, and, and you just have to be prepared for it, and that's my job. So um, I've knock on wood, <laughs> uh, been fortunate, but those things happen. What do you look for when hiring leaders? So as for leadership, I, I look at communication skills. How do they relate to people? Do they look you in the eye? Can they relate challenging information to their staff? But do it in a way that is constructive so that you come away with a solution, not, not a reprimand. So communication is important. How do they relate to me as a team member? How do they relate to the folks that are working on their own team? Oftentimes, how do they relate to folks on very different teams? So how does our finance leadership relate to the medical folks? You know, how does the medical director relate with human resources? And, and you know, making sure that you know, we're a team. And, and folks that are willing to work that way. You, you may be very technically proficient and an expert in your field, but I also need you to communicate and represent internally and externally, and people have to trust you. So, What is organizational culture and why is it important? So I think I talked a little bit of what our culture is, or at least what I feel it is. I think it's important because it, it establishes who we are, not just what we do. People will know us from their interactions with us. We have some challenges now and again with differing cultures uh, within the organization, so that can be challenging. But when people from the outside, whether you be a patient or whether you be a visitor to the facility, you know they encounter happy, smiling faces and, and engaging, and for, you know that's that's our culture. And and how do we sustain that? But that reflects on us. So, what aspects of organizational culture are particularly important to you? I put a priority on quality and. and in the healthcare field, quality is oftentimes uh, equated with outcomes or this is the right delivery of service at the right time, at the right price to, you know, to the right person. But that, that goes beyond that. You know, do a good job with getting the human resources paperwork done, doing the finance reports or, or that we're doing a, that we're compliant with the rules uh, of our grants and then funders so that we go about, you know, with the, with the mentality is I want to do a good job. 
You know, we may not be the, 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 the brightest star in terms of in the media, or we might not be the first to do it, but we're going to do it well. And when people look at us, they know there's a solid operation. So, um, I'm, I'm, that's my culture piece. Um, I think the challenge is making sure I communicate that and that people grasp it. How do successful leaders shape organizational culture? Uh, you got to walk the walk. Uh, certainly, you know, you've got to, you've got to demonstrate that you're committed to it and that how you go about things. Maybe even something as simple as, you know, you're walking down the hall and you pick up a piece of paper on the floor, the things that you choose to ignore. It sets an example. How you treat people is a huge one. You know, I, I have worked for people in the past that uh, when they were displeased, you, there was no question that you knew they were displeased and, and uh, perhaps a little more than they needed to. But you can deliver tough news or constructive news in a way that doesn't necessarily tear people apart. But, you know, again, be engaging. Listen. That's a big one right there. Did you have a mentor or mentor mentors early in your career? So, yeah, the two CEOs that I spoke to, one of them, uh, the, the hard part, I think, for the two mentors that I had is they were actually my boss, which is not something I would necessarily recommend. Oftentimes, you know, you might have some conflict or struggle in your career. And if it's <laughs> with your boss, it's not really going to work to go talk to them. <laughs> I mean, it is going to work to talk to them, but they're not one that they can advise you, give you advice on mm-hmm. the situation. So, but uh, the, the first fellow took me under his wing and purposely, and, and that was part of his own developments. He wanted to be a mentor and I was really interested in developing my career. So that worked well. And I think this, this woman that subsequently, maybe a little less formally, but she was very, a very good teacher in a very subtle way that you know, helped me adjust from being the finance guy to having a broader perspective. So I think I've benefited tremendously from having the guidance of both of them. And I'm still in contact with them and I still make it a point to have lunch with them. Uh, they're both retired, but... I still go back and I bounce things off them like, wow, I hadn't anticipated this challenge. You know, when you were doing this role, how did you do this? And then there's always tidbits that, you know, or, or things that they, they suggest to me. And there's a few sayings I always remember. And one of them was like, I was worried about how do you do everything or how do you get to know this or that in, in terms of the community. And the advice was, you know, half the battle's just showing up. You know, people will get to know you. You'll start to learn what's going on and and it'll evolve. Um, There were a few others I won't share, but again, they were very different. And that, that's the part I think I I enjoyed the most is that they weren't necessarily coming from the same background and they weren't necessarily styles were very different, very different. Like each one of them, you, you wanted to make sure you did a good job, but for different reasons. What does a good mentor do? Listen, tries to take some of the emotion out of the situation and be objective. So, you know, obviously if, if you're needing some guidance, there's something that you're either unsure about in, in, the, in the tackling a problem or a project. Oh my, oh my gosh, I'm overwhelmed. You know, I, I find that relaying, yeah, I've been there. I, this is what I did. And this is what didn't work or this is what did work for me. Now you're a different personality than I am. It might not work for you, but sometimes it's a, I think you really do know what the answer is. It's just making sure that the mentee really understands that or has the confidence built in them to go about it. I I always found it was the, it wasn't so much coming up with the right answer. It's the, how do you go about affecting that? And, and, you know, the impacts that it will have and have you considered this? It's like oftentimes, you know, the right answer might be obvious, though you might be painful to have to deal with. You know, you really need to break that relationship with that other organization or, you know, that staff problem you've been talking about. I think we both know what the answer is there. You know, time to get on it kind of thing. So, yeah, it, it gives you a little boost, a, a kind of a, a boost of confidence, I would say. How important is the mentor relationship? In retrospect, I think it was hugely important. At the time, you know, you're busy and you don't maybe don't realize it as much. Um, and, and you know, it doesn't fit all situations too. You know, it's it, it, it may be very specific to a project. It may be very specific to your career. But 
you know, early in my career, I was not in that mindset. You know, I, I wanted to be promoted. I wanted to make more money. I wanted a little more prestige, but you know, it wasn't so much the big picture problems that I face now. It's the, how do I get to this job? Mm -hmm. And yeah, there was some, some guidance from your peers and those that are doing it in front of you, but I wouldn't really call that mentorship necessarily. So how important are professional associations for development? So getting back to the networking piece, I said early on, uh, yes, I'd say they are fairly important, though I wouldn't say they're the be-all and end-all. I belong to the Healthcare Financial Management Association. Mm -hmm. I belong to our state trade association and our national. Now, there's a lot of networks there that kind of happen because of that, but a lot of these folks I would network with anyway, mm -hmm. though it does open doors and connects you with people you might not have met. So, you know, your state gets a lot smaller when you belong to an association because mm -hmm. you're, you're meeting these folks and suddenly, oh yeah, you recognize the fellow's name in the paper or, or I work with that woman on a project or on a committee and suddenly like, oh yeah, I can call them. It's no problem. If you had to pick one book that early careerist who aspired to senior leadership should read, what would it be? So I don't have a book I would recommend. <laughs> I tend to read for pleasure and not for work so much. Um, but what I would say is pick a leader that you respect. Now, they may or may not have a book, but um, their style might appeal to you. And, and, you know, take a look at it that way. You know, in terms of business books, I've always enjoyed reading Warren Buffett's books, but that's more about mm -hmm. investing than leadership. But he's got a little plain spoken style about him and he's an expert at what he does, but he's fairly simple in some ways. So I mean, it kind of goes about things for the long term and not the immediate hit, which I think would benefit a lot of us. But so, but I don't really have a recommended book for mm -hmm. say somebody coming out of college, go out and see the world a little bit, get a job and watch people watch, watch a manager and, and kind of evaluate how are they treating me? How are they treating people around them? How are they treating their peers? And then watch the leader of the organization and, and just, does that fit me? Is that my personality? Mm -hmm. Or do you think that worked? Why did they do it that way? And, and then think about, did they do it on purpose or is this just their personality? So yeah, that's how I would go about it. So. For a young person thinking about a career in health, why should they think about working in a federally qualified health center? Well, it's a growing industry, despite all the trials and tribulations of our funding. Uh, in the last 10 years, we've doubled as an industry. So we're serving 24 million with uh, aspirations of more. We are actually quickly becoming the public health infrastructure of the country. There is now a community health center in every congressional district. And while we don't serve the lion's share of the folks in New Hampshire, we are fairly well distributed. It continues to grow, and particularly as there's uncertainty in our funding environment globally, excuse me, nationally, as to how sustainable employer-sponsored health insurance is, we're here, and there's going to be more of us. We're going to be bigger. We've now in many of the centers, not only our primary care, but their dental, their behavioral health. We're looking at vision programs. Uh, oftentimes there are other ancillary programs that work with that in terms of job training, substance use treatment, you name it. So um, we're quickly becoming uh, a public health infrastructure and I think a social service infrastructure in many ways too. Lastly, what kind of training and education should someone pursue if they're thinking about getting into a federally qualified health center? So I would see in terms of leaders that are coming out that are going that are that are in community health now, oftentimes they'll have a social work background. They might have a, a nursing background. There are a few of us with a financial background. Once in a while you'll might have a, a public policy or 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 you uh, a legal background. Uh, I've seen that. Um, but I, I'm thinking most of my colleagues are, are social workers mm -hmm. or nurses, but but again, you know, as folks' talents require, perhaps those where the jobs you may find yourself, you know, social media is a huge, obviously growing area and even health centers are, are availing themselves of that. Finance is always a need and, and having somebody good in that role is always important. IT is another area that, you know, we have a large dependence upon. So, you know, obviously those are specialized areas, you know, generally speaking to be the CEO could come from any one of those areas. I know CEOs with backgrounds in all of them. So, 
Great. That concludes our interview. Thank you for your time, Greg. Thank you. Thank nice you. talking with you. You've been listening to the Health Leader Forge, a joint production of the College of Health and Human Services at the University of New Hampshire and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. Please go to our website, healthleaderforge.org, for more information or to leave comments about today's podcast. Look for Health Leader Forge podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and other podcast distribution sites. Thanks for being a part of the Health Leader Forge community, and we'll talk with you again in about two weeks.